everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for coming to our Leaders at App Nexus series. And today I'm just absolutely thrilled to welcome Rap Genius, one of my favorite. <laughs> stop, no, come on, guys, stop. <laughs> one of my favorite young companies here or anywhere. Um, and I think you're going to enjoy uh, uh, the discussion. And so um, before we get started, why don't we just do intros? So, guys, tell us who you are. Uh, I'm Elon. Woo! What's up? Hey. <laughs> this is Tom. I'm Tom. We're founders of Rap Genius. The third founder, Mothbode, or Matt, as he's sometimes called. Uh, he's the crazy one. We're the holy normal. He's in California. And uh, yeah, we've got a great show for you guys. Got some Rap Genius people We're here. Both free some All right. right. Welcome, there. Rap Genius people. Some Rap Genius people. That's Ann Scott on the end. Scottish Ann on the website. She's coming to visit for a few days. Sorry, Scottish lady. Ooh. I'm so nervous. Yeah. Uh, Scottish lady's here to visit. This is her first time in New York today. Um, give us just, uh, I know we're going to start off today. So, so the format is you guys are going to give a little bit of a presentation on Rap Genius, just so that people can get a little bit of a flavor for who you are and what you do. Um, and then uh, we'll talk for a little bit, and then we'll open it up for any questions that anyone's got. But um, are you going to cover in that basically a little bit of history of the company, or you are? A little bit, not really. No. Okay. Mostly just history of like the product and yeah. the community, but not like the company, so we can talk through that if you want to. Well, fireside. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Well, okay. why don't we do this? Get up, share the presentation, then we'll go from there. All right. So this is a little lyrical pop quiz to give you like a little entree into the spirit of Rap Genius and what we were thinking when we created Rap Genius. So uh, level of difficulty, medium. Kanye says in the song Good Morning, I'm like the fly Malcolm X, buy any jeans necessary. So does anyone know what that means? Who said that? <laughs> Woo! Hey! <laughs> so one person is smarter than every venture capitalist in Silicon Valley aside from Ben Horowitz. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's why we built the site, was there's all these amazing, interesting lines in rap. Tom was just sort of getting into rap, and we were just hanging out listening to music, uh, and Tom was asking some questions. And um, this is an example of an explanation on the site, an annotation on the site. Uh, there are over two million annotations on the site on over a quarter million songs. And where does all this great content come from? It's 100% crowdsourced. So uh, if you scroll down the page, you can see that there are 41 uh, different scholars in this song, and these are all just users of the site. Uh, the people in purple are moderators, uh, people in yellow are just regular editors, people in white are contributors, uh, and even on an individual annotation, if you click the authors tab, you can see uh, multiple people on a single annotation, all contributing to this final product, which is one great annotation uh, for the lyric, and you can even see these little bar charts here. Uh, which describe how much each person has contributed to the annotation. And you see points next to the person's name, and that's their rap IQ, uh, which is a measure of the quality and quantity of their annotations uh, throughout the site. Uh, and for an individual annotation like this, uh, you can upvote or downvote that annotation. Anyone can do that. And that awards points to the different people who've contributed in proportion to how much they've contributed to the annotation. So it's a kind of intelligent way of, uh, of doling out uh, reputation in the system. If you scroll up the page, uh, you see that the overall experience is pretty chill. Uh, you can read about the overall song. You can play the song on Spotify or YouTube or SoundCloud, depending on what song it is. Uh, you can read along with the lyrics. You can see other stuff on the album. And of course, you can click on any of these annotations. Uh, so it's just like Wikipedia in that it's crowdsourced. You know, a couple hundred thousand different contributors around the world. Uh, unlike Wikipedia, a lot of our contributors are some of the most famous artists. So um, I'm sure you'll see some names you recognize up there. Uh, Nas, Kendrick Lamar. Uh, if you're a little bit younger, maybe Joey Badass, Chance the Rapper, or something like the <laughs> biggest rappers in the game right now. Shout out to Nicole and everybody uh, over there who've done an amazing job uh, at, at making friends with rappers and managers and, uh, and labels and everybody involved in the artist scene. And we've got all this great artist support on the site. Uh, but they don't just do it because we're reaching out to them uh, or because uh, you know, it's good marketing, because so many people are searching for lyrics. Uh, it's also an interesting way to sort of write on the wall of history of your own work, your own music. Uh, so if you go to the next part, Tom's scrolling down showing you that there are actually 
thousands of verified artists from the most famous people down to just amateur kids uh, writing their own raps, putting them on Rap Genius, annotating their own lyrics. Uh, this is an example of Nas, a Nas verified annotation. And Nas is the first rapper to actually involve in the site uh, and annotate his own lyrics. And so this is just an example of why it's so important to go to the source. So this is uh, a little stanza, a couple, a couple uh, lines, where Nas is describing a courtroom scene uh, where a big fight breaks out and the defendant grabs the bailiff's gun. And it sounds like a sort of fictional account, but you don't really know where did he get this story, where did he get this idea. And Nas says he was in the studio, he was watching TV in the studio, he's watching the news, and on the news he saw this sort of scene unfold, and he saw a woman being interviewed, he recognized, wow, that's like my friend's mom being interviewed about this. Then he realized it was his friend's older brother who was actually uh, one of the guys who was in the courtroom scene, and so he decided, I'm going to put this into my song. And so it's the kind of thing that you would never know unless you went straight to the source. And if Nas just never did something like this, or maybe said it in an interview one time, or never said it to anybody, uh, you know, it'd be lost to history. So Nas gets to sort of put his stamp on this song uh, forever. This is Monster Mike. Uh, he's, a, he's a great rapper out of Chicago, big fan of Rap Genius, big verified presence on the site, and he's the sort of proud owner of the first verified Rap Genius neck tattoo. <laughs> um, but it started with rap, uh, but of course it's not just rap. Uh, it's all forms of music. So this is, uh, this is a Beatles song, one of you know, really hundreds of Beatles songs on the site. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Day in the Life or know what it's about, but I read the news today, oh boy, about a lucky man who made the grade. It's really about this guy who like, got in a car crash. You can read all about it. He was on LSD at the time. That's, that's acid, guys. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's not just all forms of music. Uh, it's all languages. So here's a, a really long French rap song uh, by this Algerian French rapper named Medine. And this is to show uh, uh, how international rap genius is. So there's a kid who's 19 years old, uh, was 19 years old at the time, named Clement in France, who hit us up and said, I love your website. Uh, can I please have a version for French music? And we said, well, we can't really make a separate version, uh, but maybe you can. And like, as we were talking, he was like, I got it. And he just went and on his own, without much input from us, built this whole community in France uh, that annotates French songs in French. And so right now there's about 15,000 French songs annotated in French, and it's become such a big cultural phenomenon in France that uh, it's the 28th biggest website in France, first of all. Second of all, this song, Medine, a very popular rapper, actually shouts out Rap Genius in a line that roughly translates to, as long as the streets keep giving me juice, I'm gonna continue to give work to the webmaster of Rap Genius. <laughs> so he's a little confused, webmaster versus sort of community of annotators, but he got the spirit right, basically, and this French community is incredibly strong. Uh, go to the next slide, a kid in Germany, same age, kid named Tobias, saw what was going on in France, loves, loves German rap, and did the same thing. He built a whole community, and there's over 10,000 songs in German, annotated in German, and this is like, this is like the Jay-Z of Germany, Max Herr. And he is a verified guy on the site, and this is a song about Zionism or something, and Berlin, Tel Aviv, and he's doing verified annotations on that, and there's some other artists involved in, on the German side as well. So this is you know, a huge deal for us to, to see it sort of go global uh, in ways we can't really understand or control. Uh, not just all languages of music, all types of text. So here's uh, one of thousands and thousands of poems on the site. Uh, this is the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, famous T.S. Eliot song. Uh, you can find out all about it. You can go read The Wasteland, or you can go read any number of Emily Dickinson poems, William Carlos Williams poems. Just search in the search box for any poet, and you're gonna see tons of poetry uh, done by a community of people who are just passionate about annotating poetry. Very cool. Uh, big, big swaths of the Bible are up on Rap Genius, and these are annotated by uh, just interested people, rap fans who notice bi biblical references in rap, and then go put up the biblical verse or chapter and make an annotation. Uh, or uh, just people who are interested in, in Bible stuff who found the site, or youth groups, or what have you. Uh, this is an interesting one. So this is chapter one of The Great Gatsby. The entire Great Gatsby is annotated line by line on Rap Genius. It's the first novel that was annotated in full on Rap Genius, not the only one. So if you look over there, it's 73 different people have annotated chapter one of The Great Gatsby. It's a very popular text, and it all started when you see that username Lucky Desperado right there. Um, this guy, Jeremy Dean. So one day, Tom and I were at the airport, and we got a little Google alert, traffic alert for Rap Genius, and it was this page. And we started looking at it, and we were like, wow, this is, this is pretty incredible. Like, this guy's taking a lot of time to do something interesting here. What's exactly he's doing? This is a syllabus for his high school AP English class. And he had his entire class sign up for Rap Genius accounts, 
started annotating parts of The Great Gatsby and a bunch of poetry and a Stephen Crane novel. And he did all this stuff, you know, like here's a screenshot, here's how you use it, here's why you use it, here's why it's important. It's really amazing stuff. And we got to talking to the guy, and now he's actually not here, um, but he works at Rap Genius full time, bringing Rap Genius into classrooms around the country, high school and college classrooms, and has had a ton of success. But it's not just literature in the classroom, and here's a graduate level biology class that used Rap Genius to annotate uh, different parts of a scientific paper on spontaneous sex changes in various fish species. So this is a pretty interesting one. I think there's, how many people annotated this one? 84, 84, scholars. 84 scholars in some graduate level biology class. Uh, you know, tell you what like uh, androgens are and stuff like that, protogenous sex change. So that's pretty interesting, like, you know, that's pretty cool. This, this, is, this is actually a sign of like government agencies getting interested in using Rap Genius. So this is the US Geological Survey. I uh, found out about Rap Genius from our funding announcement last fall. And they reached out to us and they said, how can we use this to like, because you know, they heard that there's all these other uses besides music for Rap Genius. How can we use this to make our materials more readable, more accessible, more cool for young people? And so uh, this, is, uh, this is an article about uh, storms and sea levels in some Pacific islands or something like that. And they had a scientist from the US Geological Survey come in and annotate what the different parts mean. So that's pretty dope. Uh, this is the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is a very important legal document uh, for anybody running a website like Rap Genius or YouTube uh, or Google. And so this is annotated by a guy who's a Stanford law professor, Mark Lemley, uh, who got into the site uh, because Mockboat went to Stanford Law. He kind of knew Mockboat. He's like, oh, I'm going to get into this site. And he started checking out and annotating salt and pepper lyrics. And then he was like, OK, maybe I'll annotate the DMCA. And he's like a top IP scholar in the world. So if you want to know about the DMCA, you can read the DMCA. That's pretty complicated and hard to understand. Uh, you can sort of read the Wikipedia page about the DMCA, which is pretty informative. Uh, or you can read this, where you find out which specific provisions affect what kind of thing. And this is great analysis. So uh, probably the best place to read the DMCA anywhere in the world. Um, something that uh, Dan and Gavin and, and Sean, who are sitting right there, have been working really a lot on uh, is News Genius. And so this is something that they didn't really like invent out of whole cloth, but it came out of community energy. And uh, this is basically like, news items, political speeches, uh, all have primary documents associated with them. And people love to put them up on Rap Genius and annotate them. So every major political speech that comes out, every major news event of the day, uh, whatever's going on right now, whether it's you know, the AP scandal or Benghazi or documents and press conference related to the tornado, all this stuff is going up. And there's this community of, of kids, basically, who treat it like a giant newsroom and got to get this document up. We got to annotate it. Um, so that's that's pretty interesting, pretty cool. Um, and a lot of this in the, is centered around the tech world as well, uh, just because Rap Genius has kind of like made a bit of a splash in the tech scene. So you look at something like uh, Andrew Mason when he was fired from Groupon wrote this farewell letter. Uh, this was annotated by a bunch of people, but also Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz gave their sort of inside verified annotations. Uh, Mark Andreessen, who is a board observer of Groupon talking about the controversial accounting metrics that Groupon used and saying they weren't actually that bad, uh, they weren't actually that controversial, and then the commenters kind of were like, you would say that, Mark Andrews. <laughs> um, this is uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. Uh, she, did, uh, she did some verified annotations on her introduction to her book, and it's kind of an interesting place uh, because you know, there's publishers, whether it's publishers of music, whether it's publishers of books, are kind of like, what is the deal? Like someone put up, someone just put up Sheryl Sandberg's introduction on the site and her publisher was kind of like, I don't like this. Like you're reprinting parts of my book on the web. Like this is kind of bad for me. Uh, but then we got in touch with the publisher. We got in touch with Sheryl Sandberg, got in touch with her ghostwriter, sorry. And, um, <laughs> and they were actually into it. They understood that putting an excerpt of your book on the site and actually putting some annotations on it is a great way to promote your book, to generate excitement for your book, to have a different way of, of putting your book out there into the world. So while the whole book isn't on Rap Genius yet, uh, maybe one day it'll be like The Great Gatsby and the whole thing will be annotated by interested parties. And when you read it on your iPad or your Kindle, you'll be reading it with annotations, you'll be able to interact with those annotations, and it's kind of the future of the book thing. Um, and the stuff is just very present. Like today uh, and yesterday, uh, people got into the Yahoo Tumblr acquisition. But just to show you how sort of like deep and authentic the community is, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, 
people even annotated the Actavis annotation, which is like a little less exciting and sexy than the Yahoo Tumblr an uh, acquisition, but uh, it just goes to show you how sort of seriously some of these kids in the community are taking the thing. So that's Rap Genius. Uh, started with rap, very quickly expanded into lots of other things. Uh, it's a community-driven site. Uh, verified presence, whether it's artists or experts in different fields, uh, is a big part of it. But it's really an open community. You guys should all go to rapgenius.com slash sign up, annotate something interesting, send it to us. We'll blast it. We get a little love from your friends. That's it. Questions? Woo. All right. Awesome. That, that's, that's a great overview. So thanks for giving that. And congratulations on just creating an incredible and unique asset. I mean, it's just such a great property, and you guys have just done an incredible job building it. So, um, so let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, more about the backstory. Like, was this the idea from the beginning? Hey, let's start this annotation platform and crowdsourced, uh, crowdsource the whole thing? Or, you know, what was the original concept? We were too scared to crowdsource it, you know, because if you crowdsource, everyone's going to come in and mess it up. You know, and I, I like British quotes because it makes sense to put the punctuation where it would belong, like semantically. So, like, if the period is in the sentence you're quoting, you should put it in the quotes. But if it's in the outer sentence that contains the quote, you shouldn't have we it in there. We got some nodders over yeah. here. <laughs> He's like, yep, yep, yep. So, you know, British style quotes I think are just obviously correct, and that was one of the style guidelines in the early days of Rap Genius. This shows you how far we've come. Yeah, you know? we, I mean, sometimes it's fun to look at old Google Docs and stuff we and had. So I'd be was... yelling at people like, just you know, these are all the people who we, they were our friends, and they, you know, I had some control, but this was the type of control we wanted, and 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 you know, so, Rap Genius started as Tom basically yelling at a lot of his friends. That was a big part it's of great. it. It's great. Right, now but, we changed it. But, but like, so it your, was, it your was, idea was to annotate the rap canon, basically? Was, was that the original idea? It started by just annotating a few songs. I mean, we thought one song annotated, like you annotate Tupac changes, and that was like enough, if it was well annotated, to be like its own sort of viral sensation. Like one song annotated was like, we would do it really well, and I would go through it, and Mappa would go through it, and Tom would go through it, and then we put it out, and it would be great. And that was it, and that would get a lot of attention, and we'd do like 50 of these things, and they'd be huge. And then soon after, as more people got involved, we realized like maybe, you know, it was a closed system. It wasn't like go sign up for an account. It was like you meet someone, and then you say, oh, this person's interesting, or Sean right there was the first person we didn't know uh, who was involved in Rap Genius, and we just found Sean by Sean leaving a comment at the end of a song saying like, here's something really interesting that you guys didn't point out, and we got on the phone with Sean, and then Sean we invited to contribute, and so you know that happened with Sean and a, you know, a handful of other people and a dozen other people and then 50 other people, and then songs started to go up a little bit faster, and then we sort of, based on the, the bubbling pressure from other people annotating stuff, we decided to open it up, add this rap IQ system, have different editorial levels and functions, and that's when the thing really started to explode, and we've been constantly sort of tweaking the system to make sure that the quality stayed up. And that's, that's been a challenge, and it's going really well. I mean, if you look at a new popular song that comes out, uh, you can watch it over the course of an hour uh, go up. First set of annotations are kind of bad sometimes, then they get edited, and before you know it, there's like 40 different people have contributed, and the quality's really good. And then sometimes it gets like overcooked, like there's too many annotations, they're too detailed, there are a lot of reach interpretations, and then some other sort of grumpier editor will come and delete a bunch of stuff, and that's good. And you just watch the thing evolve, but over time, the, the stuff that's reasonably popular is really high quality just from the community. Yeah. You talked about how it's exploded. Like, could you give us a sense of the kind of growth that you've seen in the business from the time you started until where you are today? Yeah, so here's, what the, here's what the graph looks like. It looks like this for a really long time. Longer, <laughs> longer, 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 <laughs> longer, wait, wait, wait. longer. And then like this, and that's where we're at now, just doing that kind of thing, and we're about 20 million monthly unique visitors, and as soon as this hits the internet, it'll probably be like 21 million uniques. Like, it's growing really, really fast. Um, what people don't realize is that 2% of all Google searches are for lyrics, and that's, you know, roughly 100 billion searches a year, and you have all these sort of undifferentiated sites, Metro Lyrics, AZ Lyrics, and what have you, and, um, you know, Rap Genius is just a better product, and it, it's taken a while for sort of Google to recognize that, uh, but at this point, we're probably gonna win all the ly lyric searches in the next year or so, and uh, you're looking at a top 10, top 20 site in the world and traffic just on lyrics alone, and that's not even including news and, and literature and other stuff. So l let's talk about lyrics then. Like, 
you talked about that, that flat line and then the explosive line. Like, so if you look at a, a music category like rap, for example, what percentage of the rap canon would you say at this point you guys have successfully had on your site and, and annotated? Are we talking about a small percentage, a large percentage? I mean, you know, <clears throat> for rap, we got a pretty good deep, you know, coverage of the catalog, but it's really just about getting the new songs up high quality and fast because, you know, what we thought in the beginning was, all right, we got to get the canon, you know, we got to get Tupac up, and that's like true to some degree, but like the amount of interest from the Snapchat generation is mostly on things that are coming out now, yeah. and so that's the most important thing to get up, and so like for rap music and most, you know, and, and other forms of music too, like closer it is to like rap or pop or whatever, the, the better, but like, you know, that stuff gets up and annotated very quickly and uh, generates a lot of excitement. And the hope is to do the same thing for news documents, yeah. you know, like for the big ones go up now, but like that's like what you've got to be on top of, you know, because yeah. people are just interested in what's coming out now. And that's true from a, a, a sort of direct traffic perspective, not direct traffic, that's a little ambiguous, but uh, from a traffic perspective, it's like the new stuff really drives the high traffic, but from the like building a living archive museum of history, uh, you know, that makes the site popular in the first place to a lot of people who write really good annotations, uh, you also go back and do the canon. So like, you know, we do all sorts of old stuff. Uh, people in the community like to do old stuff and it's great that you can go and you can search, uh, you know, Cool Keith or whatever and he's on Rap Genius. He's a verified artist on Rap Genius and uh, you have lots of annotations on that stuff as well and that helps sort of uh, funnel into the system where people kind of be like, oh, this is cool. This isn't just like the newest rap, only today's thing. Like, it's this giant museum of hip hop history which gets people excited about contributing. Also, because you need the interlinks. That's what we realized early on. Like, that's what keeps it like addictive, like Wikipedia. You know, you go to Wikipedia, you get lost. And that's what we want on Rap Genius. And that's why you need not just the early rap stuff, because of course, you know, present rap is referencing it, but the Bible and literature and everything else too, because you want every time there's a reference to something or a related sort of uh, a textual remark, you want to be able to link back to the original and then you just get sucked in. And you know, you don't even know, you know? Yeah, I mean, you I don't even know it. <laughs> rap. I was, uh, I was on the site this morning and, you know, I saw the. Obama's speech that he gave in Oklahoma as related to the tornado. I guess it was either this morning or, or yesterday afternoon. I mean, this was very recent. Um, and it was up there and it was annotated. And it was really incredible. Like it added this uh, dimension, right? This kind of texture to the experience of reading it that was way better than reading it in the news or, or watching it, uh, you know, streaming or something like that. I mean, when did you realize, what was that moment you realized that, hey, this is bigger than rap. This is bigger than what we originally set out to do. This is about annotating, you know, as you were talking about before, like primary documents, annotating, you know, all content. Well, it's funny because I had this, like, I've never had like an aha moment, I think, except for this one in my life. And this moment was when the first version of Rap Genius went up. And I, I read the first annotations that Mothboat or other founder did. And um, I just read one song. And I had that experience like, wow, this is actually the, the greatest way to experience a song. Like, this is just a, it added all this texture. And I had never experienced anything like it. And I thought, and Tom and I had, had screwed around and built some websites and tried to, you know, we worked at, at Google together, Mike yep. and I actually. I remember when I was just a, a, a noogler, uh, my boss suggested that I meet with Michael just to, like, talk to him. And uh, I remember chatting with him and asking like you know questions. I don't even remember, but uh, you know I at that point I don't know if I hit it very well. I really wanted to quit my job even like one week into it. So Tom and I were screwing around <laughs> trying to build uh, build websites, and you know we built a website that sold bed sheets, bombsheets.com. Uh, R.I.P. R.I.P. You can still find it on archive.org. Don't worry. Uh, we built a website. JavaScript doesn't work. Kind of like Venmo esque website, like share expenses thing on Facebook. A platform called Fliff, but we were just trying to build stuff and trying to quit our jobs basically. And uh, and Rap Genius was just this sort of side hobby thing. And right when we built it, I just said I just knew it was it. And you know, the tenth song on the site was a Bob Dylan song. The fortieth or fiftieth song on the site was an Emily Dickinson poem. And then the chapter of the Bible started going up. So even as we were trying to explore, like how can we expand the rap catalog? How can we really do the whole you know sort of rap canon? Um, we were finding little like sprinklings of community energy and other texts, and so I think, you know, maybe three, four, five months in, we had an inkling that this was going to be sort of like an all of text thing. But 
uh, it's only really starting to happen. Yeah. And it's also like, you know, for me it was also about like, you know, because people heard about the original premise and you know, what's there to explain in rap music? It's all about just like violence and drugs and whatever. And of course, you know, I, before I got into hip hop lyricism, I was always into, you know, the beats and the vibes of dancing and, you know, whatever. But the, uh, before I got into hip hop lyricism, I, you know, I had the same view, which was basically there's not too much like deep stuff going on here. And then I started getting into it just, you know, through being friends with Elon and, and, and Mockboat and, and so forth, and of course building the site, and it's like, whoa, there's a ton of stuff going on here, but outsiders just are putting down the genre, don't know what's up, and that's true of all genres of text, too, like, you know, whether it's like poetry or just a speech, if you are like a political insider and you listen to this Obama speech or a State of the Union, you're going to be able to pick out, oh, that's like a subliminal shot at McCain or whatever, and like, you know, an outsider might think he's getting the full picture, just like my mom thinks she understands like what's going on with rap lyrics, but uh, you just don't. And so you've got to get in there. You got to get your rap IQ up, um, and it's just bomb. So what do it. Uh, you, you mentioned that you guys were friends before this happened. Uh, <laughs> what what's the story there? I mean, how long have you known each other? Did you always want to be in business together? Um, how did that go down? Of Tom in college to show right now. Much fatter. Cargo shorts, extra thirty pounds. Oof. Um, we were just, we were friends in college. Uh, Tom and I were friends. Uh, Mappo was our cool older friend. Uh, you know, he's really crazy. You know, like when I first met him, I, no one had ever been meaner to me in my life. He was like saying all sorts of crazy shit to me. And I was like, oh my God, no one's ever treated me like this. But then we were really fast friends. And, uh, and Mappo is actually going to stay, like I was going out of town and Mappo was going to stay. I was roommates with Tom in New York. And Mapo was going to stay in my room, and so I left town, and Mapo had stayed, and then they sent me a video of the two of them doing weird stuff together, and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know it was, everybody just like meshed in a really good way. Like our personalities are very different, um, and ex like you know Tom and Mapo are both sort of extreme ends of a certain spectrum. Tom, even though with crazy hair and everything, like no one has a better mind for details and. You know, like, you don't want to get a, an email with bullet points from Tom. Like, these guys know what I'm talking about. You guys, <laughs> you guys feel. You guys know what I'm talking about. And Mopo, he couldn't, he doesn't even know how to make a bullet point in an email. He does, he literally doesn't know where the button is. Uh, and he went to law school, he went to Stanford Law School. It's on New Compose, though. So, yeah. you guys feel me. Come on. New Compose, Terrible. Anyway. You guys know what's up. You All right. Know. No one. It's not going to be new. No one knows. <laughs> And uh, and so it's just a, it's just a good mix, you know. It's crazy. Like we've it's, we've worked really hard, like to uh, try to like understand how different personalities can mm. mesh together in a co-founder esque role. And it's really really hard. Uh, and we, we hug a lot. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's we've all seen the social network, right? I mean, going into business with your college uh, uh, friends, you know, can sometimes end you up in a blockbuster uh, Hollywood movie. No, but you know, there's some you you get warnings from people about not going into business with friends or not going into business with um, with family members, stuff like that, because you know business adds another dimension into it. Like, how have you managed the friendship versus the business relationship? Someone I worked with at Google actually said something pretty wise about this uh, when we were just starting, when Tom and I were just starting to work together, and I was at Google. Uh, this girl Hannah, and she was saying, not don't get into going to business with your friend, but if you do go into business with your friend, and I think this is true about family as well, she said, you have to be prepared to close the laptop on your friendship. So basically prepare that the business thing might be so intense and so bad that your friendship is over. So I think you do put your friendship on the line if you work with someone, because if it doesn't work out and you guys fight, like you, if you go into business with a friend, you are gonna fight. You are gonna have really tough, intense, emotional times. and. My perspective is, it, if it's the right person, if it's the right people, it's worth the risk. If you, get into if you go into business with someone who's not already your friend, A, you're going to become friends, and it's going to be equally intense, but it just might not feel like as much of a loss if you have to close the laptop on the thing. So, yeah. you know, I think the relationship stuff is the same, but it's just, what are you risking? But it cuts both ways. You know, the bigger risk means there's also more, uh, you know, to keep you drawn to the idea, to keep you working on it. You know, especially when you're doing something that starts as something that's just for fun, you know, like, uh, you know, it's, it's also one of the upsides to doing something that doesn't have an immediate, like, obvious way to make a ton of money when you start, or even as a, as a, be a business, which is that you can stay committed to it much longer. You know, like if we had, uh, in the beginning, you know, waited a year and then said, okay, well, is Rap Genius, like, you know, is this going to be a huge, huge business? Like, you know, who knows, right? Like, it took like a year, a year and a half, 
about a year, but like, you know, we kept working on it because we liked it and it was with our friends. And the same thing is true when things got hard. And so, you know, I think if it's something where you're safe and you can walk away from it without totally destroying relationships, then, uh, you know, you're, you're, there's just that much more chance that you're going to make a mistake uh, when things get super, super intense. But, you know, with us, it's just, you know, that's it. Rap Genius is everything. So, you know, let's talk about a couple things or a few things that we as companies have in common. Because actually we do. Um, even though the businesses might seem, you know, really different on the surface. So one of them is we're both made in New York companies. Obviously, we've built our company primarily. We started down in Soho. We primarily built our business uh, around here on Union Square uh, and Flatiron District. There have been some challenges and so forth. Where are you guys based and where are you building the company and what kind of challenges and opportunities have you found about being here in New York? We're in Williamsburg. Woo! Anyone? Anyone? It's, uh, it's cool, it's by the water, we're trying to get, we work out of uh, several apartments now, which is cool and also annoying, we're trying to get a bigger space. I think New York's a great place to have a tech, to have a tech company, and I think the reason is all of the downsides that people say about New York, so like, the fact that people here aren't all obsessed with tech and like, look at my startup hoodie and like, what's up, and I care about your startup and whatever, that's good, like San Francisco, just like startup bubble, everyone like pretends to care and everyone's into it, and you're just brainwashed, like here, no one cares about you, no one likes you, you know, and that's good. You need to really like internalize that because that's what life is. And so you have to push harder, and that's why I like New York. What, it's in fairness, grittier. though, in fairness, I mean, Tumblr, massive New York City exit, David Carp hoodie wear. Ah, so, true. Very true. I'm not totally anti hoodie. I, I don't know. I'm going through. I'm yeah. going through stuff, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, one of the other things that we share in common, actually, as uh, companies, is we, we have common investors. So one of our original investors, uh, Ben Horowitz, I think he was one of the early investors for you guys as well. He's obviously one of the preeminent investors in the country and the world today. Um, what's the story? How did you guys get hooked up with Ben? He's, he's, he's like my third bald dad. I got my dad, <laughs> my stepdad, and now Ben Horowitz. And Second to bald dad, though. That's a little ambiguous. Are they all bald? They're all bald. Yeah. Nice. They're really bald. Uh, ben is like our... He's like one of my best friends now in the world. You know, he's just an amazing guy. We talk to him a lot. Um, he's really brilliant. He's really fucking wise. And he's like a combination of me, Tom, and Mappa. Like, it's weird to think that he has a little Mappa in him, but he says a bunch of like super controversial stuff. And hmm. you know, like, but, but anyway, ben, so we, ben sees thousands of proposals from companies. I mean, so, what's so how do we get in with him? Um, well. Uh, we interviewed him for our Rap Genius blog about rap. So we didn't say like, hey, we'd like to get your money, like Uncle Moneybags. We, and this wasn't strategic, like, we were just like, and we thought it'd be cool to invest, you know, who knows, maybe something in the future, but like, Mappo called him up and asked him a bunch of questions about rap. And Ben really, really loves rap and has pretty deep knowledge of rap and will make you listen to rap for hours and hours and hours, even when you're really sick of it. And so, he was happy to talk about rap and do an interview that doesn't have to do with venture capital or, or anything like that. And so he did a great interview on our blog. I wouldn't say the formatting of that interview was amazing. But, it was amazing. But, uh, but so he did that and became kind of friends. We became sort of friendly that way. And then when it came time to talk about fundraising, when we wrote him an email, he was a bit more responsive, but he was still pretty cool on the idea. I mean, he thought it was a cool website, uh, but he didn't really see it. And we met him and we kind of showed him some of the other stuff under the hood and he was kind of intrigued and he sort of uh, put us off on one of his other partners who we met a couple times and had some good meetings with him and um, you know started talking to Ben a little bit more it was like you know it was like a six seven month process of like building a friendship with the guy and ultimately I think like the biggest thing that was important was like having like you know human kind of moments with him so like we went over to his house he had us over to his house uh, we had dinner he kept like feeding us liquor he played us a bunch of music like everybody like got up and danced and then he told us he wanted to invest he probably shouldn't have told us like that explicitly that gave us some leverage but uh you know that was and then we thought okay it's a done deal we're done fundraising but it was like took like four more months uh and it was really hard i puked in the plane the second day twice like the first time it was really bad and like people were freaking out i was like don't worry that's it like that's net, I'm done. It's like one of those things you puke and you're done. But, but then, I think like again. The, the thing we learned from the Ben Horowitz thing was you like to, to have a successful relationship with an investor to actually fundraise successfully, uh, you got to kind of go out of context with an investor. So you probably don't want to just meet in a boardroom like a few times and then have a term sheet. Like that's, 
that's not going to lead to like, you know, we have to have some gnarly discussions with Ben, some like truly existential discussions with him about uh, the business and about all sorts of stuff and the fact that we've, you know, hung out in various different like, you know, locker rooms or whatever has been helpful. Yeah. You know, one of the other challenges that, again, both companies have had to deal with here is scaling rapidly, right? This Rapid. is a company. <laughs> This is a company that's gone from you know, 15 to 550 employees in a few short years. Uh, the number of ads that we deal with on a daily basis has gone from single digit to tens of billions per day. I mean, it's been uh, a, a massive challenge every day managing the challenges from a people perspective in terms of you know, finding the right people, developing talent, um, building our global infrastructure. I imagine those are some of the challenges that you have had to face as well and are probably facing today as well. What are the challenges? What are, the, what are some of the challenges you've faced in scaling the business to date? And what have you learned from them? Well, it's like a, for me, the biggest thing is it's like, it's, it always has been like this close friendships, close group of friends working on Rap Genius. And everyone who comes into the Rap Genius family is someone who we've known for a while, either from the community or even if it's like an engineer who comes and is new and we, they're not coming out of the community, like, you know, they become friends and it's like, it's like if you had to expand your family really quickly, like I just don't get to spend as much time uh, with all my loved ones as much as I would like and figuring out how to deal with that is really hard. You know, that's, that's really a challenge because you've got a lot of stuff to work on and you don't get to spend as much quality personal time with everybody that's necessary to do all the good stuff. Uh, and then there's all sorts of other scaling issues, you know. Running out of space, space right. is Running a big out one. Of space, and then you've got to spend a bunch of time looking for space and then you can't spend time with your loved ones. So um, there's a lot of challenges. Scaling technically is very tough. So you know, Tom can speak to some of this stuff, but uh, we've been on Heroku. Uh, we used Heroku, which was extremely helpful for us in getting up and running quickly and uh, managing our, our servers in sort of like a low cost, at least transaction cost kind of way uh, for a while, but we're running into problems at scale and we have to think about how to deal with that and prioritize getting off Heroku versus a whole suite of other features we have to build and recruiting and all this stuff. So scaling the engineering team and then prioritizing the, the, the sort of scaling tasks, how to keep the site fast and up and running all the time versus building an iPhone app, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff's really hard and you just feel like you're racing all the time. What would you say, what about you? What are some of the key lessons that you've learned? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think the biggest thing that's hard to understand about the scaling thing is kind of what Alon's saying, which is just like, you're not, you, you find yourself like, okay, I'm saying the same stuff to people all the time, trying to like explain to them, like, here's how it is to work at Rap Genius, here's what Rap Genius culture is like, and here's how you have to be, you know, here's what you have to do to succeed, and whatever. But then what you realize is that you get to say less of that stuff directly to people as the thing grows. So what you have to be always thinking about is like, okay, I'm not just telling this person something, but I'm sort of telling this person how to tell other people, you know, on the engineering side of stuff, like, you know, we are just like hella anal about code review and, you know, quality of like code and so forth. And like, I still, still spend a ton of time, like basically indoctrinating people to the Rap Genius way on that stuff. And it's not so that they will do it because they are good engineers. It's just so when things get crazy in there, the buck is gonna stop with them, you know, and then I'm doing something else. Like how, what are they gonna know to tell people? Like how can I transmit to them what I think is important so that then when they're talking to other people, they'll remember, oh yeah, like that's the thing Tom told me, yeah. you know, a hundred times. So, you know, I think that's a big part of it. And then just the communication infrastructure part, like, you know, how many mailing, you know, mailing list for this and like, okay, that's going to auto archive, but maybe especially I'll check a, it. Especially a community website. It's not just like, okay, you got the company wide email list and then this like business group or that business group. It's like, it's actually like, well, you've got like the news genius editors have like an email list and you have like the whole company wide thing. And then the company wide thing plus part time interns is like yeah. another list. And all these things have like cute names. And then you get a new employee and you realize they don't know any of these list names or whatever. Yeah. And so you've got to like, you make a lot of lists, yeah. basically. So you mentioned Heroku before, and, and one of the things that I think is really interesting about Rap Genius is you guys seem to have a bit of a nose for controversy. And, and I want to talk about a few of those things, but, but Heroku's a good example. What, what, what went down there? So the Heroku thing was just a total slam dunk of uh, insanity and, and publicity and fun. So you know, Heroku <laughs> essentially was misrepresenting the way their service works. So broadly speaking, you can imagine the Whole Foods example is the way to demonstrate this. So you can imagine going to Whole Foods and the way it is in like Union Square where you go to like a sort of master line and then that line tells you what cashier to go to. So you know, go to cashier one, that just opened up. Okay, now cashier two opened up, go to that one. 
And so that's a pretty intelligent way to route people to open cashiers, right? So you won't end up waiting in line at a cashier if there's one open right next to you. And so this is how Heroku claimed that they were routing request traffic to applications. So you have the central router and maybe you have 100 cashiers, those cashiers really representing computers that run your application, and the router sends an incoming request to an open computer so that, or server or whatever, that it can you know, render the page or whatever. And that's what they claimed to be doing. What they were doing, in fact, was they were routing requests randomly. So that's like if you go to Whole Foods and the router guy just tells you to go to a random cashier. And so you might find yourself at a cashier behind four people, and a cashier right next to you is empty, and you're not allowed to move over there or even know it exists. And so, you know, that, tends to, that, that turns out to be an enormous problem because you end up with a lot of collisions, like stacking people behind each other in, in line. And so, you know, this was a big problem. And also, none of their monitoring tools conveniently allowed you to figure this out. It was a really, really big mess up on their part. And, you know, I think part of it was an, a genuine mistake. Part of it was a kind of like simple plan type situation. You guys know that movie? Yeah. Where like one thing goes wrong and then the thing and then, you know, you kill your brother or whatever. Sorry. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, you know, we discovered this, and it wasn't like a brand new discovery because, uh, you know, there, actually later there have been people posting about this on the internet, but we were the first people to realize just how insane this was because we were experiencing such great problems at the scale we were at. So we discovered this, and as soon as I realized what happened, we were just like, whoa, like this is the smoking gun. This is going to be a huge uh, controversy. So we published this whole, you know, article exposing them basically, and uh, there's cute graphs, and you should just Google Heroku's ugly secret. And, uh, and it started this whole controversy, and now Heroku's cleaned up their act a lot. So they've, uh, you know, they uh, uh, gave a big refund to us and a bunch of other customers who had been affected during the period where they were misrepresenting it. And then they changed the metrics so that you'd be able to see this uh, sort of queue time and so forth. But, you know, fundamentally it's still, and this is why I think they kind of covered it up, it's still a big problem with the platform. You know, Heroku just, uh, you know, doing like a one-size-fits-all thing. The reason what makes Heroku so awesome is also what makes it very difficult uh, to keep going if you're at if you're at pretty high scale, and so you know right now we're trying to work with them, but it's a pretty big problem if you're running a service that's that's basically the premise is that once mm. someone starts to pay you a lot of money, they have to leave. So hopefully it's, we'll resolve it. So what does that say about your company and your culture? The fact that you would go public well, with Tom, that. Tom left out some parts of that story, which are that first thing we noticed, and then we emailed Heroku, and they gave us some technical support, and then there was some back and forth and some long bullet pointed emails saying this doesn't make sense. And then they'd write back, oh, but I think it's this. And then you know, this whole technical discussion that led to basically the CTO of Heroku starting a new email thread and writing us an email that was clearly written by a lawyer that said something like, I'm gonna, it's time for me to bow out of this discussion, blah, blah, blah. And it was clearly they were like, you're right, we're gonna hide behind the lawyers. Like, we're screwed here. And then we kind of were like, are you serious? Like, this is really your answer? Like, we've just exposed this huge thing, you're gonna just sort of hide? And then when they didn't sort of respond to that, that's when we decided to go public. So it wasn't like we were like, yes, we found something wrong, let's write a big blog post about it. It was actually about a lot of internal debate about like how to go public, when to go public, if to go public, why to go public, where to go public. But going public uh, is something that you guys well, do a lot. Like why? Well, yeah, you gotta it, shine the light on it. I wanted to go case, public the whole time. Yeah, Tom, it was Tom just was, a slam dunk Tom fact that he was like, not You could see the veins in his head. Like we'd be just like, you gotta shine, you gotta, we whistleblower. Pacing back and forth. Gotta blow the whistle on these motherfuckers. Yeah. yeah. With his not speaking, but with his lips composing the yeah. blog post in his mind. It was right. just apple I was okay. at the gym. Okay, okay. But but you know, you guys have gone public with some other stuff too, right? I mean, there were some controversial comments made about Mark Zuckerberg, uh -huh. right? Like what 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 well, went down there? We didn't really go public with that. So that. What that happened was, was <laughs> that was that was Vivance related. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, we went to a barbecue uh, that Ben Horowitz generously like set up basically for us, which was like us and Nas and Mark Zuckerberg and Mark Andreessen and Scott Forstall who invented iOS and some other like tech luminaries and the head of Kaiser Permanente. It was like 15 people, a bunch of like Illuminati uh, baller types and us. And you know, they were, everyone was getting drunk and Mark Zuckerberg was there and Dick Costolo was there and Mock We had our iPhones. Mock, yeah, we had our iPhones. <laughs> And Mockboat is, while Mark Zuckerberg and Dis Costello are talking, is like, yo, Mark, like, can I take an Instagram with you? And Mark was like, kind of like, uh, maybe later. And we're like, oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. And me and Mockboat both were like surreptitiously like snapping pics of, of, and I took some beautiful pics of like Mark Zuckerberg and Nas. But anyway, posted them on Instagram. Mockboat posted some on the Rap Genius Instagram. Uh, and no one found out until a couple days later when some like 
rap blogs picked it up and like, what's, Mark, what's Nas doing with Mark Zuckerberg? And the Facebook PR team alerted Mark about it. Mark freaked out and called Ben and said like, why are these guys like going paparazzi on me? And, uh, and so there's this long, Mappa wrote this long, beautiful apology to Mark Zuckerberg talking about like, you're our inspiration and you're the reason why we built the site and I feel like I've angered Moses. Please forgive me, <laughs> you're a prophet. And it's like, and Mark was kind of like, okay, okay, fine. You know, that would be like a two-line email, which is like, I, I believe you made a mistake, like, don't let it happen again. So we're like, okay, fine, I think we're clear. Ben's not mad at us at all, really. Everything's fine. And then a couple weeks later, Mapo is giving a talk at Berkeley. He's being interviewed by some blogger right before the talk, and Mapo is all hyped up. His ex-girlfriend's gonna come to the talk. He's super excited about that. And uh, he's taking Vyvanse, which always makes him a little crazy. On the come up, it makes you On negative. On the come up, and so, yeah, super negative. And so he does this interview with, it, with him and he's sort of saying, he's just telling him what happened with, with Zuckerberg and he's saying like, you know, I took this picture with the dumbest thing I've ever done. I feel super bad about it. And then he flips and he says, but honestly, fuck that fool. Like that's Nas. Like well, he should be proud to have a picture with Nas. And so at the end of the interview, the guy's like, anything else to tell me? And he's like, I mean, what else can I tell you? I told you Mark Zuckerberg could suck my dick. I told you like da 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 da. And so it was kind of like he referenced something saying, that didn't. So he wasn't like Mark Zuckerberg suck my dick, but the headline was, Rap Genius Founders tells Mark Zuckerberg to suck his dick. That exploded into a huge thing. Great headline. So, it's brutal. So more apologies. Ben Horowitz Too calls perfect. us. He, he calls us and he's like, Mock Boat, I'm in Mark Zuckerberg's driveway. He's not going to let me into the gate. He's not going to let me into the gate. And he's like, just kidding, just kidding. Um, which I don't know if he's kidding, but... Uh, <laughs> But so, you know, Ben has a pretty good sense of humor about all this stuff, even though, you know, this was pretty, pretty serious. It all smoothed over, everything was fine. And then two weeks later, I wake up, check like the Rap Genius, like Twitter, and, uh, and there's this giant rant, this anti-Warren Buffett rant, which is like, Warren Buffett has no compunction. This guy invests in, this guy's on the board of Coca-Cola, feeding sugar to the masses, giving everyone diabetes, making everyone obese. He, didn't, he doesn't invest in the internet, he invests in, a, in railroads, like, this guy's the worst. And then final tweet, all caps, Warren Buffett can suck my dick. From Rap Genius Twitter. And so we call Mothboat, you know, it's, it's like, what are you doing? He's like, this is my way of apologizing for the Zuckerberg thing. And he's like dead serious. <laughs> I'm apologizing, I'm clearly making a joke. But he also has beef with Warren Buffett over some old stuff, so like. <laughs> It's kind of it's, so. Yeah, he, he's just a, he's just a guy who will say anything. He's a polemicist. Like, these guys all like I'm like looking over there because they're all like kind of like rolling their eyes and because he you know he'll say stuff that like really makes everyone really frustrated, but he's right. also really really funny and so he's a polemicist. True polemicist. Yeah, but I and I want to open it up to questions too. So the mics are open now. If anyone wants to ask a question, but isn't that kind of a a, a tactic from? the rap music world too, which is kind of like going public with feuds and using that as a way to like self-promote and so forth. It just happened very naturally, but like we're not like, let's do the rap beef thing, but we do get in a lot of beef. Yeah. It happens. You get in, you get in a lot of beef, a lot of internal beef. It's true, because we shine the light on it, you know? We blow the whistle on Warren Buffett. Yeah, that guy has no compunction. No compunction. <laughs> Zero compunction. Now you all know. <laughs> all right. We got kicked out of presenting at an Omaha tech conference because of that. So. It was uh, big Omaha. Silicon Prairie. Silicon Prairie. I think. <laughs> all right, let's open it up and uh, yeah, hey. system. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, A, how that came to be, and B, how you go about conceptualizing, oh, uh, this will give you so many points, this will take away points, things like that. Sure. So, uh, uh, Alon came up with the term Rap IQ. I got to give a shout out for that. That was genius, because Rap Genius, Rap IQ makes perfect sense. Uh, so it came around to, right about the point where we opened the whole site to contributors. We wanted a way to like measure people's uh, contrib contributions. And I don't know, it's tricky, you know, like the first version of it, we were kind of like, all right, here's the first version, we're throwing it together, you know, 30 points for this, 10 points for this, whatever, like let's just revisit this in a couple of weeks, but for now, and then so that lasted like two years, and then we were like, all right, let's, let's revamp this thing, let's really revamp it, and we did do a good job revamping it, and uh, it gets pretty complicated, because the thing is like, you know, people get obsessed with this stuff, like it's easy to lose track of that when you're designing it because you can get obsessed with it for a couple weeks and then if it works you're designing something else but people 
uh, are obsessed with the feature, and so you have to make sure it works and is consistent and, and is not like super gameable. So like you know, it's there's a bunch of like technically sophisticated stuff going on. So for example, as Alan alluded to, like when you upvote someone's explanation on Rap Genius, right? Like so, how does that award Rap IQ? Well, first of all, who wrote the explanation? If it was multiple people, then each of them has to get Rap IQ according to how much they wrote. But you can only get Rap IQ for votes that happened after you wrote something, right? And then how much Rap IQ do you get for the vote? Well, that depends on the Rap IQ of the voter, too. And so it's a very complicated, like, Byzantine system that intersects with, like, it's, Mappo likes to say we're a lot like Samurai Japan because the Rap IQ system also intersects with a bunch of other permissions you can get to determine, like, your privileges and abilities and prestige on your site, on the site, and, like, what color your name is and so forth. So it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. To answer the question. Hey, what's up? Hey. I'm uh, Cam, a UX designer here. First, I'll say I like those J's, those Jordan 3's. Congratulations on finding those. I can't find them anywhere. <laughs> my man. So, so my question is, um, like I've been using Rap Genius probably for a couple years, like Wikipedia for hip hop and stuff, and I've always thought it was cool, but it doesn't seem like it's a platform where people donate to it. So my question is, you guys raised you know, 15 million bucks or whatever. How do you actually make money? Uh, well, we got that 15 million. We, got about we did million. raise that money. We got the money. We got about a million and a half, or a little bit more than that before for like a, a seed round. Uh, we have not made any other revenue outside of a couple experiments. You know, like we tried a little bit of ads in the early days just to see what would happen. Um, you know, we don't make any money. Uh, there's lots of possible ways we can make money. And clearly, if we win all the lyrics uh, on the internet, we're going to be this big, big, big website. And that could be an ad business, uh, or that could be something else that's kind of interesting. Uh, it could be a data business. Uh, you might sell the seller license, the software to other companies. So one thing we're getting a ton of inbound interest on, and you might have read about, it, is like enterprise genius. So take like the CIA, for example. Uh, they've got an analyst over in uh, Lebanon uh, writes a memo. Uh, they need to send it back to a team of analysts in, say, DC. Those analysts need to comment on it. And the way they currently do it is they have some document storage system. People download it, then they write some emails and some documents, and that's organized by some like admin person, and it's all a mess. And there are all these files, but uh, our communication slash annotation platform is really kind of optimized for something like this just by accident. So we have a lot of enterprises and government agencies interested in using a private version and that can be a big business. But for now, we're just trying to grow this consumer thing uh, over the next, this 15 million gave us enough sort of runway for the next year or two to try to keep growing really fast and be one of the sort of pillars of the internet. And when we do that, hopefully someone will give us an even bigger chunk of investment money. <laughs> no, and then we'll make money. And then we'll make money. And then we'll make money. But if you think about like the size of the cultural, you know, so it's like imagine this scenario, right? So you're a kid, you're reading lyrics on Rap Genius, okay. Next day you go to school, you're decoding your re classroom reading on Rap Genius. Okay, you go to law school, you're, you're, you're studying the annotations on the Constitution to graduate. You go to your law firm, your law firm uses Rap Genius white label software to analyze cases and memos and whatever. You become a judge. You know, you're balling. So the point is it just scans your whole life. And if you can get that, if you can make that happen, like, and become, like, the fabric of just what it means to be, like, a human on the internet, like, you know, the hypothesis is that's incredibly, incredibly valuable. Annotated but eulogies. Eulogy annotations, you're dead now. Do you, do you, how do you think about the brand? I mean, Rap Genius, can the brand Rap Genius scale to, you know, be used as an annotated source for judges? Well, just, just get ready tonight or very soon, we're going to start our first, you know, something we've been talking about for a couple of years of partitioning the site to have some sort of different home pages for poetry and literature uh, or news or rock. Uh, you're going to see some sort of channelizing of Rap Genius. Uh, you know, we, we run into objections all the time. You know, we're trying to get Rap Genius in the classroom and people say, how can I have my kids doing stuff where there's swear words and it's branded as rap? Read the Canterbury Tales. That's nasty, you know, <laughs> literature. Um, and so, you know, you have people objecting. I, I think, like, more and more, I think rap is becoming part of uh, mainstream culture and becoming accepted as part of mainstream culture. So you get sort of less and less of those objections. But we're not going to change it to, you know, genius.com slash rap, genius.com slash right. rock or anything like it's gonna that. It's going to be rap.genius.com is what Alon's trying to. No, genius.com <laughs> is not available. 
not available. And, and we so, don't like it. Yeah, I mean, we just think rap is sort of central to the, the idea. They think we think all text, all poetry can be sort of construed as rap. You know, when people say, like, oh, all rap is poetry. Like, all poetry is rap, too. So we kind of really like the Rap Genius brand. But when, you, when we start to partition the site, I think people who are really into it for the Bible, say, are going to feel like they have their own home, their own groups, their own social features, their own you know, blog posts and stuff like that. So hopefully they'll overcome the idea that it's centrally Rap Genius. I kind of like it, actually. I'm going to talk to Brian. Maybe Rap Nexus is a Rap Nexus. That's yeah. brilliant. Oh, my God. I love it. All right. Hey, what's up, guys? Um, so that's actually a pretty good segue to my question. Um, obviously, you guys have gone you know, way beyond just annotating rap lyrics. I was wondering if you, know, you guys were maybe looking to do like, other media, you know, maybe you know, annotating like, a Family Guy episode and annotating all the references in the episode, or you know, what you guys are planning you know, going forward or something like that. Yeah, definitely. There's, uh, you know, there's other, we have a video product, actually, which is kind of like something we tested out where you can annotate music videos and you can sort of pull from the annotations on the lyrics and say, this one should come in at this time. And uh, that's a pretty cool product. And that sort of is a gesture at what we could do with annotating movies, annotating TV shows, and stuff like that. Uh, and there's a lot of demand for like an art genius type of product uh, where you maybe take like a little lasso tool and take a work of art and uh, take a piece of it and write an annotation and finally you have this clickable work of art. Um, that's something we'll definitely develop, but it's sort of, we're just saying like, what is the community interested in doing and how hard is it to build that stuff versus the other stuff we're building? Uh, but other media is definitely something. We have a community of people who are interested in depth and context and annotation, and we don't want to just limit it to text. Yeah, I mean, you know, another aspect of that, and which gets at what you were asking earlier about scaling your team and scaling the company and how you do that is like, there's so much stuff like this that's so cool and it's just like, why can't we build this? And we did build it. We built this video product years ago, right? Where it's like a kind of a pop-up video type experience. And lassoing an art thing would be cool too. It's like, why can't you build all this cool stuff? And there's, you know, forget all the cool stuff you could build. There's tons of rough edges you can file down and make, ways to make it easier. But like, what you have to do is just have laser-like focus on the priorities and stop doing like small, quick wins, like file this thing down, like make this thing better for people. Like, just stop doing that. And, and as your team grows, it becomes even more difficult because someone comes in and the person, you know, maybe the person's unfamiliar with like how crazy stuff is a rap genius. They're, they're, they love all the product direction, so to speak. Like all these people want all this stuff. And it's like, you know, fuck, I just work on this thing this user's asking for, this moderator is asking for, and make this person's life better. And that'd be great. That'd make me feel good. I got to do it. And as it grows, you just really have to really get people to focus on just the big important things. And it's tricky because the big important things are the stuff that you know no one really can think of that they that they want, and they're risky. You know, like we're trying to build like uh, some this newsfeed product that'll you go to the homepage, you'll see all the songs that are tailored for you know just your interest based on who you follow and all this kind of stuff. And it's like risky, and no one's asking for it. It's like how do I get myself to build it? And the answer is you just have to force yourself, and that's something you have to do very consciously. Otherwise, you'll get lost doing a bunch of small cool things, basically. So that's another side of why we're proceeding a little bit slowly. Hey, so I was wondering, um, how'd you guys get your first verified artists on Rap Genius, and what's your process now of getting rappers to verify their lyrics on the website? So, so Nas was the first verified artist, and uh, we had this investor, Troy Carter, who's Lady Gaga's manager, and uh, right down the hall from him, when we were first meeting with him, uh, he said, oh, that's Anthony, Chuck to Anthony, that's Nas's manager. And so we just really wanted to score an interview with Nas, basically. And we thought, OK, we'll do an interview. But since we're Rap Genius, we're not just going to ask him normal stuff. Like, we're going to ask him lyric questions. And so we asked him lyric questions. And we decided to cut up the video into individual lyric answers and embed those videos on the annotations themselves. And we were like, wow, this annotation is what is just different from other annotations. Uh, this should show up differently. This should be featured in some way. It should have a different color, a checkbox, or whatever. And then we realized, like, you know, there's going to be more of this stuff. Uh, more art, we, we want more, more stuff like this. And so we wanted to build a product that artists could use themselves so they could, you know, we could verify an account. And, uh, and then those person's annotations will show up differently at top of the other people, show up green, whatever. And uh, so Nas was first. Nas set a great example for other people. So when we go out to the second person, we can say, hey, you know, you've heard of Nas. Like, look what he did. He did these great annotations. So it's just been a lot of work, you know. It's just been a lot of work. And all the people sitting there have done a ton of work. Uh, for artists big and small, like the biggest artists going through managers and labels and trying to get the big artists and doing high touch stuff with them to trying to scalably work with smaller artists and teach them how to use the site, make it really easy for them to use it, promote it uh, for them and 
So, you know, there's thousands of these amateur artists and then basically everybody at the top, except for like your Kanye and Jay-Z and Eminem, basically have verified accounts and that's just due to a ton of like grinding. I think it's like, it's like sales in many ways, sales and support and managing relationships and making friends and being, you know, teaching and stuff like that. So it's just, it's been a lot of work over a lot of time, basically. Cool. All right, we have time for two last good questions and then we're gonna wrap, Neva. Thanks so much for coming, guys. Um, you're rightfully very optimistic about the business. What, looking forward, scares you the most? I mean, that, what I just talked about scares me a lot. It's just how can you keep focused on the important things rather than doing stuff that's good but not crucially, crucially important. And that's something that I find myself falling into. Like, there's just so much stuff you can work on and it's just paring it down to only the crucial stuff is, is really, uh, uh, it's not only really hard, but it's hard to know if you're doing it right because you could be doing it wrong and you're shipping a bunch of stuff and people are happy, but it's not stuff you absolutely need to do. So that's one thing I'm concerned about even at this size and like momentum, it's gonna get even crazier. I'm basically concerned about like macroeconomic collapse would be the only thing basically. <laughs> like that's the thing that could really screw us up because then, you know, fundraising climate's probably not great. So yeah, I think I think we have some great momentum. We got a website that's not going anywhere. So, you know, personal stuff, I want everybody to be happy. Um, management slash just relationships as the thing gets bigger is we're all new and we'll screw up a lot and we hope we don't screw up to the point where people are unhappy and it, you know, drives the business into the shitter. Hey guys, uh, I was wondering what your early fundraising process was like. I mean, now that you have a huge Series A round and uh, are putting a new layer on the internet and whatnot, it sounds great, but I imagine that the early meetings where you had to be convincing people you know, of this vision. So, you know, what, what did it take to get your first seed round? So we supported ourselves for a couple years. You know, we lived cheap and took, had side jobs. Tom worked one day a week at a hedge fund. Uh, I worked as a hypnotherapist. Mockbode was living on like $6 a day and was like, you know, doing some like various like Whole Foods, like shady, like- So you take the macadamia, yeah. oh, sorry, you're about to tell. No, you tell it, you, you tell. tell it, Tom. <laughs> you so ahead. you take like the macadamia nuts or whatever from the Whole Foods bargain bin and then you take a, you label it Great Northern Bean. Because, like, what is a great northern bean? But, you know, it's like $2 a pound or whatever. And so you can just rack he up was hazelnuts, macadamia <laughs> nuts. Eating, and that was how he kind of survived. And he One would... easy hack is they have the super expensive almonds. We did this, actually. In the, yeah. You can just say they're the normal ones. I don't remember. They're like that. the, what are they called? Like the Swedish But in, in any case, like, you know, we, we, it was very bootstrapped for, like, a long time. And then we applied to Y Combinator, and we got rejected. And then we applied again, and we, after growing somewhat, and they accepted us, even though they were extremely skeptical about us as a business. And uh, Y Combinator is a really good, like, sort of Silicon Valley game genie, like cheat code, uh, where you do, if you're doing well, if you have a cool product, even if you don't have a cool product and you're decent at presenting, uh, you're able to raise a seed round. So it's really kind of like cheating, although it's still really hard to raise the seed round. Like we spent four or five months. Uh, going around raising the seed round. We have 23 seed investors because we were taking cash from like wherever we could get it because it's just hard to raise money always. But uh, by the time we raised the seed round, we had a ton of traction. And we, had, we already had a graph that looked like this and we probably had three or four million monthly unique visitors and a lot of examples of stuff in other genres that gestured at this sort of all of text thing. Some meetings went well, some meetings went poorly, but uh, it took a while to raise money. Traction definitely helps. But the seed still was way easier, even in retrospect, than the Series A. I mean, the seed, if you have some traction and your goal is to not have to get a normal job, so you personally can keep working on it, putting aside like getting an office or hiring people, then like, you know, raising the you know, 500K or whatever it is you, you want to do that, like, is just not that hard if you have like a ton of traction compared to like a Series A type situation where even if you have like a lot of traction, it's not like you can just go around like in the seed context and pitch people and maybe you close one person or not close another person, keep going, as Alon said, maybe meet 20 people. With the Series A, it's much more like, all right, like now it's time to meet one person and get married forever and like come into the secret room and sit in the secret chair. And so that is a way more like intense thing uh, than the seed round. And it's, it's way more like a, a complicated like dating, meeting your, your future, like, you know, whatever. So um, I think, you know, you want to wait on doing something like that. Like my, my whole view on the whole fundraising thing is you just want to wait in terms of progressing like super fast. Like oh, I want to raise a lot of money and you know, 
do Series A or whatever, just like wait and chill and raise as little as you can to get some traction because once you go like the Series A route, it like really gets pretty crazy. It's been fun. Awesome. It's been a good time. Okay, a couple quick announcements. Number one, um, we're gonna have drinks and some snacks outside afterwards. So if you wanna stick around, have a glass of wine or a beer, get to know uh, Elon and Tom a little bit better. You guys can stick around for a few minutes. Yeah. Can we stay mic'd up? Oh. <laughs> And uh, second is, uh, we've got a great event here uh, tomorrow night. Um, it's the March for Innovation. Um, it's a discussion about immigration reform in the US, a little bit of a different topic than uh, what we're talking about tonight, but a very important topic, not only for the country, but also for the tech industry. Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures is gonna be here, Brian O'Kelly and others. Um, so those of you who are AppNexus employees, you can register for the event, and if you're not an AppNexus employee, um, we'll figure out how to um, get you the, the, uh, the link so you can register if you're interested in attending. Um, I wanna thank you guys. Um, Rap Thanks Genius is brilliant, it is genius, and I wish you all the success, obviously, um, and uh, let's stay in touch and hopefully build a couple of great uh, New York Tech success stories together. And uh, what can I say? Best of luck to both of you. Thanks so much for Woo, being here. Cali style. Boom. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. I love you all. We'll be answering questions all night. <laughs> Mike's up here.